for life. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys. Hi. Um, I'm Frederik. My uh, talk is called Bird's Eye View of API Development. And this is a bird's eye view of API development. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's>, uh, that. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'm Frederik van Brabant. I'm a software engineer at Made with Love. Made with Love is a company uh, from all over the world, from uh, France, Belgium, Brazil, uh, Canada, all over the world. We work together, cool projects, and try to make our company and clients happy. Um, I'm also part of the PHP Antwerp team, with, uh, together with uh, Freek and Dries. Those are those guys. Um, if you ever want to have a talk at PHP Antwerp, more than welcome. But first, ask me. But first, <laughs> ask him <laughs> if you're allowed. <laughs> okay, cool. So, what's this talk all about? Um, API development. So, your front end or your mobile guy or girl or whatever in between asks you to build a, an API. And uh, they, they ask you, uh, want uh, the blog post and, and those kind of things. So you come up with this, and you have your ID, you have your comments, you have your uh, blog post, and you're all pretty restful, right? Well, not really. There are a few problems with this approach. Um, why is this approach not that great? Well, kind of check it out. So first of all, the URL is kind of structureless. If you go back to the URL, you can see get blog posts. Um, how does that scale? How are you going to ask for uh, additional comments or extra fields and stuff? Um, what if we have loads of articles or loads of comments? Here you have just one comment, uh, one article with two comments. What if we have 5,000 comments? How are we going to solve uh, issues like that? Um, I need to write documentation. Everybody loves writing documentation, right? We all do it all the time. Um, well, you're going to do it much more with this, with this approach. And uh, is this secure? I'm not talking about the connection to the API itself, but this structure itself, is that secure? Well, these questions and more we're going to solve today. Great. So first of all, the endpoint. Um, quick refresh, HTTP verb. So that's the first thing, the get in this part. And we have the endpoint itself, the get blog post one. Um, we're going to cover this a little bit uh, into detail just so we're all on the same page. First of all, we're going to talk about uh, the HTTP verbs. Uh, important to know, HTTP is not REST. REST and HTTP are two entirely separate things. Um, you can have a perfectly functional uh, API that's perfectly based on HTTP, but that's nothing uh, even close or remote to REST as we showed in the first or second slide. Um, this is the way we interact with websites. We've been interacting with websites like this for like since the internet was born. Um, this is just basically HTTP. Um, there are more uh, verbs than we'll cover here. We're just going to cover the basics. Um, another thing to know, HTTP is not CRUD. So create, read, update, delete, it's not the same thing as HTTP. We're going to cover the verbs. Well, those verbs aren't a one-on-one -on -one mapping on what's actually happening. So let's dive in. First of all, we're going to see the post. Um, if you don't, if you're not all that uh, familiar with what an HTTP code is and a verb and stuff, don't worry, just write a wave. We'll cover it. <laughs> okay, so a post is just like a form you uh, regularly submit to a website. It sends a payload to the server and returns an empty body with a 201 HTTP code. Um, if you're sending um, to an endpoint that doesn't exist, uh, you're going to create it. No, sorry, that's not correct, sorry. Uh, this is most used to create new endpoints. That was what I mean. So this is an example of a, a post. Here we're going to send on the post, and we uh, send along uh, the payload, that's what the body is called, the payload, uh, a title and a body in this case, and it doesn't return anything as we discussed earlier. Okay, get, this is just how you receive data from a server, good old get. Um, you can send parameters along, we'll cover that later. Um, 
And this is just how a normal web page works. So you, send, uh, you don't send a payload along. It returns a collection or a single resource. Resource doesn't have to be JSON or XML. It can be HTML. It can be actually anything you like. So here you have a get. Uh, here we're going to get the, the, second, uh, the post with ID2. It just returns the title and the body, same one we uh, sent er earlier. Next up, put. Um, put is used to update a resource. You need to send an entire uh, resource, uh, entire object itself, to update an entire new resource. You don't get anything returned you, uh, because, well, you know what you've sent, right? Um, you need to send uh, the entire uh, resource uh, in its entirely. So here we have it, uh, a title and a body. Again, uh, reminds us of, of a post. If you're putting, this is a bit uh, um, here, sorry, my slide isn't perfect. So here, the posts, uh, it should be like post and slash ID. So if you want to update uh, post one, for example, and post one doesn't exist yet, you can redirect it with a put and then create post one with those data, okay? And then we have patch. Um, what does patch do? It updates part of uh, a resource. So if you just want to update the body, you can do that in this. Uh, this is um, the difference between put and patch here is so you don't have to, uh, to run into async issues. So if one person wants to put update uh, just the body and the other person wants to uh, update the title, then they get conflicts. In that case, you'll use patch. You can just update part of the um, resource. Now, there is a little uh, funny thing about patch. It accepts instructions to update the resource. And the original meaning of that was this. And that's not something a lot of people uh, like to see. So what's happening here? Uh, this is RFC 6902. I had to read that. I didn't know that. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> uh, so here we send instructions to the endpoint what values we want to update. And this is like yeah, nobody actually uses it like that. And all the big APIs uh, are sinning against this approach. Um, but no worries. If you send along a content type with application partial update JSON, you can just send it along like you well, usually do. Um, the funny thing is RFC 6369, 96, sorry, um, just um, included this like you would regularly use the patch and you don't have to send the content type along. Um, you should still do it, but it's not uh, necessary anymore. You can just use it like you used it, used it uh, all the time. Just uh, a nice to know uh, thing. Okay, uh, last of all, we have delete. Uh, well, yeah, delete, you remove stuff. That's kind of basic stuff, right? Uh, you don't get anything returned because, well, you, you removed it, so you can't have anything returned. Um, the thing you need to know about delete is you don't actually have to delete it. You just have to not show it anymore to the, to the end user. Um, example for a delete, well, yeah, not much to show here, right? Uh, we talked about HTTP codes. We've seen a few HTTP codes pass along. Um, now, how do you know what HTTP codes to return to what endpoint? Uh, errors uh, return different HTTP codes and stuff? Well, it's pretty simple. You have an easy to follow guide here. Uh, no, 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 don't do that. That's a very bad idea. Uh, what you're going to do is um, just uh, take your front end developer and your mobile developers, a few backend people, maybe a manager, yeah, because everything's free, man hours. Uh, just spend uh, half a day figuring out an, HD, uh, an API, what codes should be returned, what is descriptive, and stick to like seven or something. So everything is concise and everything is, is meaningful to everybody involved. Okay, so here we have a, a few regular ones. They're, uh, separated in a few categories. So we have the 100 range. These are just the basic things. You probably won't see them because, well, if everything goes right, you don't have to see them. Like information, nah. Okay. 
Uh, the second is 200 range. It's a success range. Everybody's happy. Um, one cool thing, if you send a 202 long, accepted, that means that if, for example, you've sent a file that needs to be uh, compressed or compiled or something, you can just send 202 back and compile it in the background. So the user knows that the file has been received and everything is okay, but it's not ready yet because it needs to be compiled. So, cool. Then you have the uh, 300, the redirections. Um, here, the fun, the fun one is the 300, multiple choice. For example, if you have uh, slash videos slash funny cat video for, um, and you offer it in a few um, formats, for example, uh, AVI, MP4, those kind of things, then you can uh, send the default one, the one you would like to send um, default, for example, the MP4, with uh, a 300 with multiple choices, and a header with a location header where you can find the different other uh, extensions. Can be handy. How would that location header look? Location, double print. No, no, okay. <laughs> uh, you can so comma separate them, comma or separate. that's kind of up to you. Um, okay, then you have the client errors, so like um, the day fucked ups. Um, well, this is an overview of just a bad request, unauthorized, not found, pretty descriptive, right? Then you have the last one, the 500, the uh, you fucked up. Um, well, the error is mostly on your part here. Uh, you don't have to worry about sending those along. They will be sent along automatically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, HTTP headers. Um, so you send that along with each request and response. It's metadata on the data uh, on the call, and you can define custom headers. So here is an example from a request header overview. The first line is, well, you've seen that before, it's uh, the verb. The second is the HTTP protocol you use with the version, in this case, 1.1. Uh, 1.2 is right around the corner, it's gonna be pretty cool and everybody gonna like it. So uh, stick around for that one. Um, and then you have the host, where you, the host still, and a lot of information. So um, we're not going to cover everything, of course. Fun thing to know, the ones with the X, in front of them, those are called uh, custom uh, headers. You can define headers as you like. You can stick to the default ones or you can uh, create them yourself. If you create them yourself, stick an X to them. Everybody knows what it's all about. Um, responses. These are the status codes. Um, then you have a couple of headers and directly beneath them is the payload you actually return. So in this case, if we, by the way, um, what we're doing here is just calling Google, the homepage of Google. Um, in this case, the HTML from Google itself would appear right here. So, uh, and this is again, uh, the headers you return. Uh, again, two fun custom headers. Okay, cool. So we talked about that endpoint earlier, like the second, third slide. I was, I said something was wrong with it. Um, well, yeah, let's, let's fix that. Okay, um, now we're going into REST territory um, and HTTP as well, of course. Um, what do we want from our endpoints? We want nouns are good, verbs are bad, so posts, not get posts. We want to uh, always have uh, nouns and always use plurals. So posts, why would we always use uh, plurals uh, instead of person and people? We're just going to make it concise and always use plurals, mm -hmm. so post and people and data and stuff. Um, consistency. Um, fun thing to know about uh, those endpoints is they don't need to match your database structure. Actually, it would be kind of bad to have them match your um, database structure. It's not a one-on-one -on -one mapping. You're not making an interface to your database. For example, here, here we're going to get <laughs> books. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry, my bad. Um, so here, books, for example, is a, is a collection of books, writers, and prices. Those are different tables in my database, but my client doesn't need to know that. So you have some flexibility on your API uh, part. Okay, cool. Um, the endpoint itself, so how are they matched? Um, here you can just have a post, here you have the first ID of post, 
then you ask for all the comments of posts of the first post and then you ask for comment 15 of post one of course you can just have comments 15 but that's like a structural decision you have to make how you're going to do it. Um, I talked about uh, how this isn't really secure. This looks pretty secure, but it actually it isn't very secure. Um, this is a better uh, solution for that. Here we're going to use slugs. In this example, uh, for a post, we're going to use uh, the title of, of the post itself. Of course, you can't always use that. So, um, a better solution here would be UUIDs, which is of course something not... Is everybody familiar with UUIDs? Well, I'm just going to cover it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, UUIDs are some semi-hashed um, slash random uh, unique identifiers. That's why, that's why it stands for unique identifiers. Um, so the cool thing about it is it's unique everywhere. So if you create a, uh, it should be unique everywhere. If you create one, uh, uh, a company in Taiwan who is just creating blog posts with UUIDs won't have the same one as you. Normally you shouldn't uh, collide with each other, normally. Um, the cool thing about this is people can steal your stuff. That's the biggest security flaw about stuff like that. It's like, if you know post one, well, then you can kind of figure that there must be a post two and a post three, and then you can just scrape the entire application for everything they own, because you're just going to skip over every ID they have. Same with the slugs. If you can figure out it's always a title and how it's separated in spaces, yeah, you can just scrape everything. UUIDs, not the case. Um, a few additional uh, cool things about UUIDs is you can create them asynchronously. So if your mobile application uh, creates a new post, they can uh, create the entire post in their local database on the, on the mobile device, and then send it back to the server when it has connections. So they can create the UUID on the machine itself, and then later on send it with the UUID to the, uh, to the uh, endpoint or server. That's a cool thing. And the last cool thing about it is Nobody knows how many users you have. <laughs> so it looks pretty impressive, right? I might have like, well, wow, four billion users or something. Well, nobody really knows. That's cool. Okay, so everybody still with us? Everybody 200? That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, the body. We had a body. Um, here we, the, the things we ran into was like, what if we have lots of comments? What if we have lots of uh, posts? And what about metadata, pagination, all the stuff? Well, um, we should handle that. Luckily, it's already been done for us. Uh, JSON API is a standard, uh, very popular. Battle tested and grown to be, a, up to be the standard, pretty cool. Um, what it's all about, it's just a standard how your uh, payloads should look. It's pretty flexible. You don't have to follow it to the letter, but if you follow it, like big parts of it, you'll, you'll do fine. Um, there are two alternatives to it, like uh, JSON and Hall. They're not as popular, and I don't think they will last the test of time, but JSON API definitely will. Looks kind of like this. Uh, the first thing you might have noticed is, yeah, Star Wars. Yeah, cool, Star Wars. This is a, an API built by Paul Hallett, uh, a famous Python developer. Always cool to mention that at PHP meetups. So um, this is just an example. Uh, the, PH, uh, the Star Wars API doesn't follow um, oh, JSON API to the letter. It has an interpretation on the JSON API. Um, we're going to look everything uh, over just a minute. Um, but first of all, we're going to check, uh, as you can see, we have results and some metadata at the top. Let's first look into that. So um, we're now going to check out pagination. So as you can see, it's mapped in results and those results is an array, is a collection. So let's check those links. Uh, you have three types of, of pagination in API development. You have page-based, as you can see here. You just attach a query parameter to the end. We'll, we'll discuss that later. In this case, uh, an X and a previous. Well, 
for the quick thinkers out there, we're on page two. Um, and how many items are at the current page? Um, cool, right? Um, then you have the second one. That's basically how a database works. You set an offset and a limit. This is pretty cool because you give the end user flexibility on how many uh, resources and how many items they want to have returns. So in this case, 30, you'll send it along. Uh, uh, important thing to notice here, uh, set a limit to your limit. <laughs> so yeah, a limit to your limit. So uh, a, a smart developer might ask for like a limit of 50,000 and then yeah, you don't have any pagination again. So then your uh, data will be huge and nobody will be really happy. Um, this is, in my opinion, the best one to use, but there's, of course, a third one. This is cursor-based, um, mostly only used by Facebook. Why? Because they have loads of data. Uh, this is how a hard disk works, actually, actually uh, cursor-based. So you define your data into data blocks, which you give something like a UUID. It's not a UUID, but it's a, it's a data string. And then you can just ask for different data uh, segments. Why would you use this? Well, if you have an API that's like very, very, very performant, like uh, if you do a post, well, your post is now on page 15, like two seconds later, then this is quite a solution for you. 90% um, of the cases, this is <laughs> way overkill, like way overkill. It's horrible to develop, it's horrible to use. So. You should not use it, but uh, you can use it, but well, just know it's not going to be pleasant. Okay. Uh, this is the body of that, um, that uh, API response earlier. This is just a segment of one part, the Luke Skywalker part. <laughs> um, there's probably something you have noticed, it, noticed before, like um, the films, for example, or the species. Well. That's, they're not a collection of data returns. Uh, they're a link to the data itself. And then the response and the question you always get asked is, is API development, what? <laughs> uh, what? Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I can't have nested resources and stuff? Why, why, why can't I have rest, uh, nested resources? Well, it's not very HTTP. We're looking for, um, in this case, for example, Wikipedia. Here you have a uh, Flash Gordon page of Wikipedia. You're not interesting, uh, interested in all the data of the, uh, the sto who wrote the story, who wrote the screen page. There are links to that data. It's not part of the data. It's not Flash Gordon. I don't want to see the biography of Mike H Hodges. Hodges. I should have practiced that. <laughs> so. That's not how, how, how data should work in HTTP. Also, um, it's very easy for your developers or your clients to navigate your API. Here you have an overview. Here you have an overview of, hey, whoa, I have just uh, a resource of a person in the, in the film. Oh, what films? Oh, there are endpoints for films. Oh, there are endpoints for species or for uh, vehicles. That's cool, you don't have to write documentation for that. That's cool, right? That's cool, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so uh, that's called HATIOS, hypermedia of an engine, uh, as an engine of application states. That's not going to be on a quiz, that just remember it, cool for pop quizzes. Uh, it's not a serial, HATIOS, it sounds like a serial, but it doesn't. And this is the most overlooked part of REST there is. So if you don't have HATIOS, if you don't have the structure, then you're nowhere clear, uh, near a REST API, a RESTful API. So uh, if you take anything away from this presentation, let it be this. HATIOS, pretty cool. Everybody should use it. So here we are again with uh, the HATIOS example. Um, as you can see, uh, the films here have like links to, as you can see, they don't use UUIDs because it's an open, ID, uh, open API, so don't really bother. Um, and you can just follow along easily as I discussed. 
And then you get something like that. Question probably on all, all of your minds. I'm not going to make 500 uh, calls just to ask for comments. Like if I want to have all the films, I'm not going to do three additional calls to have the films if I just have a mobile app uh, application with uh, the character and the films he's in. I'm not going to <laughs> keep calling, keep calling, calling. So luckily there is a cool uh, solution for that. First of all, as we discussed, you can just ask for all the comments, like linked, and you can uh, uh, comma separate the uh, comments you want to have returned. It's pretty cool. The Star Wars API doesn't support it at the moment, uh, but it's uh, perfectly legal to do something like that. So comments, uh, two, four, six, and eight. If you just want those comments returned, you get a collection with those comments returned. And then you don't, uh, the cool thing about this is um, it's very uh, conservative on your data. So you only get the data you requested, nothing more, and you have a slimmed down version of uh, everything that's available. So, okay, cool. And um, can't you, uh, this is something that pops up all the time. Can't you do like thing called query parameters? We'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, something like this, like, I only want to, uh, and I want to include comments and likes. For example, on this article, comments and likes should be attached in the traditional, not restful way. Um, you could do something like that. I personally hate it because again, it's not restful. It's not HTTP-like. Um, it's, it's actually, it is restful, but it's not very HTTP-like because you're looking for the article, not the comments and the likes attached to the article. Uh, but the thing uh, brought up here, like the include, that's something pretty interesting. Those are called query parameters. Query parameters is like you uh, uh, do requests to a database. You do it to filter data. For example, I want an overview of all the cheeses, but I just want the brie and the cheddar. Uh, all the types, brie and cheddar. So you get an overview of all the cheeses a store might have that uh, comply to the filter uh, Brie or Shatter. Uh, this is perfectly legal, perfectly correct, um, but it's only used to filter stuff. Uh, both examples, by the way, are uh, legal. The first is a comma-separated version. The second is an uh, array version. The second is a little bit more correct, but uh, don't bother with it. Uh, you, can, you can use whatever you like. I, I personally think the first one is a little bit easier to read, so. Okay, cool. Now the fun part, authentication. Cool, how do we secure all of this? Uh, before we head into this, uh, first thing to know is, well, you can do all the authentication you want. If you don't have SSL support or HTTPS, then you're not going to go anywhere. Um, use it. These days it's semi-free with uh, Let's Encrypt. I, Reds, they had a big data outage or, or a big bug a couple of uh, weeks ago, but well, better than nothing, right? Get what you pay for. No, it's not true. It's, it's, it's a good service. It's a good service. Um, okay, uh, the authentications we're going to uh, check out tonight are HTTP Basic, JSON Web Tokens, and OAuth 2. Um, yeah. Uh, there are, of course, other options. Maybe more be uh, better options, maybe worse options. Um, the thing here is always it's a, a balance between security and ease of use. So use what you want, but keep in mind that you want to have at least some protection in your application, right? So first of all, HTTP basic, it's very basic. It's very well known. Um, you know this, you've, you've used this a million times before. Um, works kind of the same as uh, on a web page, like uh, those HD access stuff kind of things, right? Um, so you send a username and a re uh, password on each request, and you just send it along on each request, and if it's valid, well, you're in. If it's not valid, you're not in. Um, again, super, super important, SSL, HTTPS, if you don't have that, you're sending passwords and usernames directly with your browser, so you're going to have a bad time. Uh, second up, JSON Web Tokens. Not very known. Too bad, because it's really good. The cool thing about it is it doesn't have database hassle. 
but it needs some, some getting used to. Uh, everything you need to know about JSON Web Tokens is everything is in the token itself. All the data is in the token hashed. Um, very quick to set up because you don't have to bother with database stuff and stuff. And this is basically how it works. So let's quickly go over it. We have a client, we have a server. Mm -hmm. um, the client sends credentials along, just like in HTTP basic. You send them along in best case in an uh, authentication header. Um, the server returns a uh, token. That token is valid for, I think, seven days. Don't pin me on what? Oh, you can specify, but I think it's default seven days. Could be wrong here. Um, you send them along on each additional request, just authentication with your token, bearer token, um, and then you're in. The cool thing about it is you're not sending uh, username and password along. You're sending a hash token along. So if something would happen, like a man in the middle attack or something, then they're just, they still just have a token. They don't have your password. Then they can abuse that for seven days, of course. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah, that's that's the biggest downside um, for that. But it's perfect for like uh, um, an in-house API with a mobile application. If everything is in-house, then you very good for that. Next up, OAuth two. Um, as the name might have suggest, it's the second coming of OAuth. Uh, OAuth 1 was actually better as OAuth 2, and that's a controversial topic. Um, but it was very, very complicated, like very complicated, and a hassle to use, and nobody really liked it, and nobody really wanted to use it. So OAuth 2 came along, was a bit less secure, but a, like huge uh, amounts of uh, user friendliness extra. Um, it does have database um, stuff, so yeah, that's something not so flexible about it. But uh, the cool thing about it is, is you can uh, send, set up your own rules. So you do have those flexibility back, those flexibility back. Um, okay, let's dive. Oh, by the way, this is a very simplified uh, example of, of OAuth 2. OAuth 2 is kind of complex, but this is just a simplified version of it. So again, send the credentials along, just like in JSON Web Tokens and HTTP Basic. Returns the token and a refresh token. And then we make new calls with the token, the original token. This is all very JSON Web uh, Token uh, example, E. But then, after those seven days uh, pass, then you can send the refresh token to the refresh endpoint, and you get a new token. The refresh token is valid for three months, something like that, a long time, a long time. So the cool thing about it, each time you refresh your token, you get a new refresh token as well. So you can keep using your, your tokens you have infinitely, and in the worst case, only three months. So that's a huge, huge security update over HTTP basic and somewhat of a security uh, update on JSON web tokens. So yeah. Um, these aren't better or worse than each other. If you want, if you can use HTTP basic, uh, sure, why not? It's not like it's invalid or, or unusable or, or insecure. Or, okay, another cool part, API versioning. Like everybody loves API versioning. Okay, the cool thing about API versioning, the most important thing you need to know about API versioning is you shouldn't have to version an API. Um, Versioning APIs is very um, unpleasant. Uh, yeah, it just take a couple of more uh, uh, hours in setup and define a very stable, well-defined API and try to avoid versioning your API. The thing about versioning your API is that you will eventually have to version your API. Uh, product change, business rules change, maybe something wasn't that thought out as you thought it was. Well, okay, there are solutions for that. Um, this is the most common used one. Uh, we tag along a V1 after our API and then just go our merry way. Uh, the good here is like it's easy to implement. You can just paste your endpoint to another guy or girl or something in between. Uh, 
and everybody's happy. You can just click it and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it's easy to see what version you're on. The bad part here is root, sh root shouldn't change. So if you're going to version two, well, you have a new root and the rest should stay more likely, more or less the same. And the, that is actually metadata that should head in a header. Uh, the thing here is, this again isn't very um, HTTPE. So you're asking for the first version of the artist if you're just looking at the API here. Uh, API version one of artist Taylor Swift. Like you're not asking about the first version of the API. No, you're asking about the first version of the artist. This is semantically wrong. And it's one of the biggest complaints against it. Uh, this is another uh, example how you can solve it. Here we're going to define a custom header, the X, as we discussed earlier. Then API version, it's a custom header. And then which version are we on? Um, interesting to know here, if you don't send the header along, you, you just get the latest version indeed. Uh, this is m more correct E, um, but you still like have to create a custom header, which is somewhat not great. So, and you need to write documentation. Um, yeah, <laughs> you need to inform your, your end users of each time you're, you're planning to update your API and stuff. It's a kind of hassle. The third one is actually pretty, pretty funny because there's already a header that um, could solve this. This is the accept header. Accept header, um, if you send it along, you're, you're, you ask for uh, what you accept to get returned back. In this case, an application from the vendor and then your website, your version number and what format. In this case, JSON could be XML, could be YAML, could be whatever if you, you want. Um, this is, this should be the best way to, to handle versioning, um, but it's not the most obvious one. Again, as with the custom header, in this case you have, an, uh, you have a, a default header, but still you need to have all the benefits and uh, the downsides of, of a custom header and header stuff. So yeah, as I said, <laughs> versioning APIs is a pain in the ass. Um, to end the presentation, I'm just going to quickly shoot some random tips because I couldn't fit them anywhere else in the presentation. So it's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> That's not true. Um, okay, start with the documentation first. This sounds obvious. Nobody does this. Um, okay, the cool thing here is you can use uh, two things called uh, Blueprint and Swagger. Those are formats to write APIs in. Um, there are websites where you can write those uh, standards in, for example, Apiary. I, I kind of love Apiary for that. And um, you just map everything out. This is the, the part where you're going into a, a meeting with a design guy and a, a front-end guy and a mobile guy um, to just map everything out, see how everything works, how everything ticks. You write it down in Markdown, that's a cool thing about it. And then you can just, um, either way, just paste it as documentation or stick it in something like Apiary. And the cool thing about Apiary, in this case, they have a tool called Dread, and Dread just looks at your documentation, checks it against your endpoints, and runs tests automatically. So you're not only writing documentation, you're writing tests at the same time. You can just stick it along, it's a markdown, it's very easy, and you can just run them. Yeah, I think they, ran, they run in JavaScript, so it doesn't, uh, you don't need extra plugins or, or uh, modules or, or anything in your PHP. You can just run it on top of your stack and just checks your documentation, unit tests it, and as anything changes, you, you're forced to update your tests, and in this case also your documentation. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, look at the tech first, uh, look at user first, not the tech. Um, this is kind of, uh, beneficial to everything in, in software development. Um, you don't have to create a REST API. You can, so if SOAP fits your needs, go for SOAP. SOAP isn't bad. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it just, just know 
if you like, if you're um, straying away from the path of a standard, then know why you're stray straying away. Always make sure you don't kick yourself in, in the head later on. If you're going to sacrifice parts of your application, like sacrifice standardization, just know why you're, you're uh, sacrificing it. That's the biggest thing to take away from that. Uh, this is very PHP. Um, you should always typecast your return values. If you uh, default return them, you can have some very interesting results. So always uh, create a transformer to return your, your uh, resources. Don't just uh, do JSON, your, your objects or, or whatever it is. Always uh, cast them so you don't have uh, funny things like Booleans that come out as strings or, or everything that comes out as strings or some PHP-ness. Uh, okay. Um, again, some general wisdom, I guess. Consistency is king. Um, just uh, make your API usable. API development is also kind of a bit of um, UI, uh, UI development because you have people that interact with your website and you're, um, okay, they're developers, so they should be a bit, little bit more savvy, but that doesn't mean they don't have to have a nice user experience. And this is uh, the entry point of, of your application on a lot of uh, developers' sites, so make a good impression, I guess. Test your endpoints, yeah, we covered that before. Like, um, you don't have to use Dread, but you can just use acceptance testing or something. Never trust your users. Again, yeah, it's software development for you. Um, especially in API. API is just raw data, raw I.O. Um, this is the easiest thing to exploit if you have access to it. So uh, never trust them. Always check twice. Um, yeah, general stuff. Um, cool. If you use uh, PHP, check out Dingo API if you use Laravel. In that case, um, Dingo API is a is a beautiful package. It's a collection of everything you need to know. Uh, you need to have to create a perfect API. Um, if you're just rocking vanilla, uh, the PHP leak um, with its president uh, Phil Sturgeon, the the PHP API deity, um, they have a bunch of uh, great great packages to for you to explore and yeah. Of course, high quality because it's a leak. Uh, if you use Python, because everybody here is using Python, right? <laughs> um, the and Django in this case, so it's more sp specific. Even uh, the Django REST framework is uh, somewhat like the uh, uh, Dingo API. It's very cool. Um, uh, the Django REST framework is used to create a Star Wars API. So it's a great, great uh, tool. Um, okay. Want to know more about this? This talk also has a text form. I wrote a blog post about it. You can find it there. Then you have uh, Phil Sturgeon's book, Build the APIs You Won't Hate. It's a great book if you want to start using, uh, start with uh, API development itself. Even people who know or think they know everything about it will uh, know something about it. I get something about it. Uh, the great O'Reilly book, it's like, <laughs> A Bible for API development, so it's kind of getting a bit old, but those technologies don't really age. And um, well, then just a final conclusion. That's what. That's why Vim is better than Emacs. So, <laughs> okay. Are there uh, questions? No, it's just uh, popularity. JSON API is is, um, is storming the API front in in standard. Hull probably won't be abandoned by its user by, by its use case uh, user group or, or uh, maintainers, but its uh, its popularity is diminishing. So yeah, if you it's a great standard actually. It's it's really good, but yeah, it's getting less and less popular.
Yeah, that's uh, that standard in practice. Well, it's possible to do. <laughs> I, it's not wrong. It's if you send along in location headers, it's actually somewhat correct because it's relevant to the to the return uh, return data you get returns. So it's not wrong. It's actually kind of right, but it's not user friendly. I think so. I that's why the, the standards came up with with the metadata uh, block. So yeah. Okay, hear me a lot. If you have later questions, you can find me on Twitter here at the Adonian. Also, um, I would love, 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 love to have some joined in uh, feedback on my presentations. I'm always eager to learn. And uh, yeah, then just thanks. <laughs>Thank you very much, and um, we're gonna later put the QR code with the feedback form. I think it's really interesting. We had two speakers for the first time. We really nice uh, if we could leave some feedback for both of them. It's very useful for them. Some of them are also taking these talks to uh, conferences or something like that. So if you saw anything that you think maybe in a conference, uh, you know, it could be tweaked, then th that's uh, really useful usually. Um, so. We, it looks like we're gonna have a meetup next month and I'm gonna upload uh, details on that as well. Um, but we are running short on speakers this time. So it used to be venues, now it's speakers. So if any of you guys want to talk again, uh, if you already had a talk or give your first talk, then just approach me and we'll arrange it. Um, I'm also gonna do a little shame, shameless plug. Um, Matthias Farras is having a DDD. Um, workshop in Leuven at the end of uh, this year, I think it is, around December, I believe. And he's offering a 100 euros discount, uh, which is like a third of the price. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, it's uh, one of the best people to learn DDD from. Um, I'm gonna proceed with raffle. Um, and um, what I'm gonna do is pass around a paper or maybe a phone, so you could just write your name down, and then I'm gonna raffle. Uh, plural site subscription uh, for one month to the winner. So thank you for coming and I hope to see you next month.